Hello, I am Gavin Rymill, writer, researcher, illustrator, ichnogenous enthusiast, and I'm here to enjoy the greatest film ever made, which is Dalek's Invasion Earth 2150 AD. And joining me once again with his lilting Somerset tones is fellow Dalek researcher John Green. Hello, John. I'll be on. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just get Google Translate. You looking forward to the film tonight? Very much so, yeah. Weather's not too hot there yet. It is incredibly hot. <laughs> incredibly hot. And I'm already sweating. Excellent. With nerves and the heat. Nice. Nice. Uh, our third viewer tonight, Doctor Who magazine writer, researcher, Reese Williams. Hello, Reese. Hello. Do you prefer this or the first film? I think it's got to be this one. It's it's carried off with a lot more assuredness and there's yeah. far more brutal extermination, which is always enjoyable. I think you're right. Uh, and tonight we are delighted and extremely honoured to be joined by a legend, <laughs> giant amongst Doctor Who historians, not literally, a man who's been patiently replying to our nagging emails for over 10 years, gets a credit on almost every YouTube video we've done because of his constant drip feed of archive materials. A warm welcome to Mr. Richard Bignall. Hello. Hello. I love your nagging emails. <laughs> I live for your nagging emails. <laughs> well, I, I can step them up if if that's really what you want. <laughs> I try to hold myself back. I mean, you've been you've been immersed in the files at Caversham since what late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, yeah, it's been goodness, um, nearly twenty five years. I've been going there. So wow, was it the was it the locations book that started your visits there? Yes, it was. Yeah, I treasure that book. I love it. It's still it's still not far away at any given moment. Was that your first official work other than Doctor Who magazine? Uh yeah, first published work, yeah. Um I must admit it gave me a little bit of a thrill when the uh new series was very first announced and there was a little bit in Doctor Who magazine where Julie Gardner said that she'd been looking through it. So <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I had a little bit of a air punch moment there. Oh, that's awesome. And you were Part of the original uh, DWM time team. I was. Was it the original lineup? Yeah. Yeah, part of the original lineup, and we did the films as well. Yes, that was for me at the time. Uh, that was always my favourite feature. That was what I turned to and read first. Oh, it was great. Was it as much fun to do as it as it seemed? Because it was so well written up, it just made made me envious. It was. Um... I mean, a lot of people got a bit sniffy about it, saying that it was sort of very contrived. <laughs> um, but actually, it was it was a remarkably easy thing to do, to, to actually sit down and to uh, watch an episode of Doctor Who without having any, any forethought about what was coming, mm. just about what you had seen. Um, was actually a really easy thing to do, and it was it was really good fun doing it and uh, noticing all the th little things that you'd not particularly noticed before about the program. Yeah, um, just in your casual watch. Well, we'll uh, hopefully have some exciting observations tonight. We're delighted, excited to have you contributing. What was your overall feeling about this film as a comparison to the first, and and overall as a Dalek adventure? Oh, I love it! Absolutely love it. Um, I saw this, it would have either been on its original television premiere in 1972 mm. or on its second showing in 1974, probably both, certainly by 1978 when it had its third showing, um, when Swap Shop was uh, having its summer holiday. Um, I was a fully-fledged fan then, so <laughs> I actually recorded the soundtrack off the television uh, of this on a little silver... C90 Waltham silver labeled cassette. And I played this thing to death. Yeah. Um, I became slightly obsessed with uh, 2150 AD. Uh, a year later, I spotted the um, Walton 8mm version, black and white version, part one in a small branch of Dixon's and almost had a heart attack <laughs> um, because it was the first time I'd ever seen any. Doctor Who in that sort of format, in a sort of live watchable format, mm. actually there that you could actually go and get mm. and relive something over and over and over again. Mm. Um, 
and this I, I adore this film with a passion. Mm. Uh, it's it's crusty and silly in places, <laughs> but I, I think overall it's a it's a superb piece of work. Yes, well, I think I think we're all in agreement broadly on that. So um, on that note, shall we shall we get ready to watch? Uh, if you are watching along at home, you will need your Blu-ray copy. Pause it after the Studio Canal logo. Uh, so that we're ready to start with Takata and Feud. Uh, the DVD sadly won't work with this commentary due to the different frame rate, so that will go out of sync. Uh, but if we are all ready, paused after the studio canal, ready to go on zero, three, two, one, play. Why does this film start with Takata and Feud? Don't know if there's any particular reason why. Laziness. I love this first scene. I think it's wonderful. It's just perfect film craft. This set was used for three different locations throughout the film. Yeah. Um, it was built a couple of years before for a film called The Counterfeit Constable. It actually appeared for the first time on the set the year before when they were making Doctor and the Daleks. Um, around the time that the film Promise Her Anything was being made, uh, they did some promo shots there over the two years the set was up it was used quite a few films and the tv series danger man was made there yeah as well mm. in Zabotsky's original script for this tom wasn't a policeman at all the story actually opens with him waiting to make a telephone call and uh, some young woman is in the call box and she won't shut up so he gets fed up to go off and have a look see if he can find another phone box and just happens to spot a police box in someone's garden. And he's a little bit mystified about it. He's going to wander away. But um, no, he turns back. And it's almost a rerun of how Doctor and the Daleks actually starts mm. in many ways. Yeah, it's, uh, he meets Susan and Doctor Who first. And then Barbara, and it is Barbara, comes and joins them. And the um, he ch he chooses where they go because he doesn't believe them, does he? He's, they, he says, oh... 50 years in the future, please. So Doctor Who sets the control. That's right. And it's actually specified as 50 years, a couple of places in the script very early on, that they have arrived 50 years in the future. So theoretically, this should be taking place in 2016, <laughs> which I suppose would tie in more with having Sugar Puffs posters mm. and Del Monte posters and various bits of architecture around um, more than it would having it in 2150 AD. but. I guess 2016 doesn't sound quite as exciting. <laughs> it is a little strange that in both the TV and film versions, they don't make much great effort to to show a sort of future civilization, do they? It's almost ignored. These titles, we might consider them an intentional approximation of the Howl Round effect used for the TV series, but they're actually remarkably similar to the titles for another film shot at Shepperton called Die Monster Die, starring Boris Karloff, which has an almost identical whirlpool effect in blue and red tones. So I wonder whether that was either the inspiration or if, in fact, they reused footage shot for that film. And, of course, we've got Bernard Cribbins in this film rather than Roy Castle. Interestingly, Roy Castle did say that he was very interested in doing it. The only reason he couldn't do it was that by the end of 1965, he was already contracted to go to America to appear as Sam Weller on Broadway in the production of Pickwick with Harry Seacombe. Oh. The only problem was that it was a bit of a disastrous run. <laughs> Pickwick closed after 56 performances in December. So theoretically, uh, Roy Castle could have actually done it, but of course yeah. by then they'd already made the decision that they were going to go with hmm. go with someone else instead. So Bernard Cribbins came in. And of course, um, Gordon Fleming was familiar with uh, Cribbins because he'd worked with him before. So uh, there's probably a solid reason why they chose Cribbins. Would it be interesting to see what what, what it would have been like uh, with Roy Castle in it instead? Yeah, which, which I guess would make sense as well, seeing as the original draft did have Barbara. Yeah. So, you know, it would have been reuniting that, that original team back for, for this particular story. 
Yeah, it would have been a, a quite different sort of dynamic. Do we know why Jenny Linden didn't return, replaced with Louise? Uh, no, but I would I would guess um, that when they decided to have Cribbins instead, they decided maybe to use another another sidekick instead. There's a weird thing in this TARDIS set. Well, there's a couple of weird things. Behind Susan is a steam railway locomotive pressure gauge. I think it's got <laughs> Great Western Railway or something written on it. But the TARDIS doors there are freestanding mm. about six feet in front of those black drapes, which is really peculiar. And they are actually the um, the doors from the prop as well, the actual TARDIS prop. They are. Removed from the TARDIS prop, yeah. I'm fairly sure that uh, I've spotted details in in, the, in them that uh, you can you can see in the main prop itself. Oh, well done. The other thing uh, I found interesting, you know, in the when we did the commentary of the first film, you pointed out that when the TARDIS dematerializes, uh, everyone stood still, and I joked that they were waiting for a rollback and mix effect. Mm. Um, that's actually scripted. Ah. When when the TARDIS travels, the occupants are frozen in time, and when the TARDIS lands, uh, they unfreeze and their movements resume, and that's in Sabotsky's script. So we know who wasn't reading their scripts properly. <laughs> yes waving their arms about i much prefer this this tardis interior yeah so there was this myth around the the, the tardis prop being blown up in an episode of the new avengers but uh, oh. and after a bit of work we managed to disprove that and uh, you could see that in one of our earlier videos mm. now i i think this is a superb set yes mm. uh for years uh, i i I think it's the lighting on it. Yes. Um, I think they light this particular set so well. It is such a naturalised mm. outdoor type lighting. Mm. Um, I mean, it's really only the sort of rather um, crummy backdrop that actually gives it <laughs> yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for that, I think you could um, you could easily be fooled that this was a, a location setting. Yeah. It really it it's tied together with the shots of the Thames really nicely with that. Uh, as you say, it's like perfectly overcast day, isn't it? And according to the script, this is supposed to be somewhere near Hammersmith, <laughs> which doesn't tie in at all with... Sloan Square, St Paul's, <laughs> and the BT Tower in the background. Yeah, because you just saw across the uh, the river that the, the opening shot there, um, you see Lotch Road Power Station, which is in Chelsea. That's uh, You also see that in Doctor Who, actually, in Logopolis. So when the fourth Doctor is meeting the Watcher on Chelsea Bridge, there's mm. a shop down the river and you can see Lotch Road Power Station in the background. Ah. Well, we just got a nice shot of St Paul's over in the background. So <laughs> that and the post office tower make it quite tricky to triangulate all this. This is some of the small amount of good character material he gets in this one, Cushing. Mm. I think they have a nice rapport, these two characters. Yes. You were saying uh, in the first movie about Cushing always asked for a, a blue item to offset his eyes. Yes. Well, there he's got a his scarf. scarf. And so now we move into the Bendy Toys factory yes. just down the road. <laughs> and ironically, of course, the Bendy Toys factory were making Bendy Daleks at the time. So yeah. um, perhaps it would have been a little bit too obvious to have those lying around there. <laughs> <laughs> There is quite a conspicuous open box with Bentley toys spilling out in a moment, isn't there? With what I always thought were a Roger Rabbit toys, but presumably that wouldn't be the case. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> and quite how was that? Uh, yeah, was he was still just, stood up? Yeah. What, why was he stood up and why was he stacked behind the boxes? Now, interestingly, in the in Sabotsky's original script, at this point, um, Barbara, as this would have been, uh, actually sees a dead rover man floating in the water. Mm. For for years, people thought it was done at the Queen Mary Reservoir. Yes. Um, but we, after a lot of sleuthing, we managed to work out it was actually done in Battersea at the St Mary's Church at the same time they did the Dalek coming from the water. Ah. There's a sluice you can just make out in the background, which gave the location away. We do get a description of the Rover men, so they're not uh, quite as they appear 
uh, actually in the film. So they're actually described as having a strange plastic globe covering their head <laughs> and two large metal discs in their ears. So hmm. um, that's how he originally envisaged the, uh, the Robomen turning out. Hmm. Might that um, shot of a body floating in a river, might that have been something that the the BBFC objected to? Because we know that they provided some feedback for the first movie and that altered the script. Quite possibly, yeah. I mean, it's um, the body does it is supposed to reappear uh, in a few minutes' time when um the doctor and uh tom go down towards the river when they're chased down towards the river they um they see the rubber men uh, at that particular point uh, as well so yes it could well very well have been something that they objected to didn't seem to mind about the knives though did they <laughs> <laughs> it's very knife heavy this film isn't it it was only uh, only on a later watch, and I'll point it out when it comes that one of what I thought was a, a punch to the stomach was a knife to the stomach. Ooh. I thought he. I thought there's a bit where um, is it David? David. Yeah. I thought he. I thought he just winded a robo man, but he didn't. It was a sharp winding. So this is uh, this is Jackie Cooper falling out of the door, and someone else doubling for um, Cushing. Yeah. It's not the best wig, is it? <laughs> but it's not the worst. No. I always love the way they, they managed to make the door fall off at exactly the right point. Mm, That's yeah. a very, very clever yeah. way of uh, of um, putting the uh, the trick of the jeopardy yeah, over. Yeah, you have to be very trusting of whoever was on the trigger for that. Yeah, again, a, a seamless switch between location and and the studio work for the fall out of the door. There it is. That that's a really odd moment where the the music completely cuts out for the ship to come over. You would kind of think the ship was worthy of some dramatic music, but it's all the more effective for just this awesome, powerful sound effect. Yeah. When the moment's gone, the music comes back in. It's a really complex three-part optical shot, isn't it? Because you've got the studio work at the bottom. You've also got the matte painting seamlessly integrated with the footage of the saucer flying over. And I can't quite work out how that's done unless they shot the saucer through a glass mat. Um, this whole sequence actually appeared on screen test. Ah. So they they had this whole sequence of all the stuff down the river and then coming down. Now, just uh, looking at this particular shot of the, the ship going down towards Sloan Square, when it takes off again, it is a completely different um, <laughs> vista that you have. Mm. But when you look on the trailer, mm. they, are, they are using that particular shot of the building. So the takeoff that you see in the trailer is completely different from the one that you will see in the film. Um, so they they obviously sort of filmed several different options, but yeah. uh, the ones with the buildings it's slightly different geometry of the buildings, but it's the same buildings taken off. But that only appears in the trailer. There are some editing oddities throughout the film, aren't there? Mm. Certainly in fight scenes, yeah. you can see where they've sort of jigged stuff about. Sugar puffs were planning rather than the competition they they ended up running. Uh, they were going to do a free giveaway, serial giveaway for this. Um, they had previously done, had a couple of successful giveaways with um, luminous models. Uh, they did deep sea fish a couple of years earlier. And I think a year or two before this, they had done some spooks. And they were looking to give away, um, if they were going to be the same sort of dimensions as what they'd done previously, uh, five to six inch luminous Daleks. Uh, that were sort of cut out of plastic, um, but they uh, decided that they were going to go for the competition instead. <laughs> so it was at this point that they would see the dead Robermen, then turn round, come back, and the two living Robermen would be by the TARDIS, and then David shouts his warning. Giving the Robermen guns is, specifically ray guns, quite an obvious... Uh, thing to do. It always seems a bit strange to go back and watch the TV version where they're just sort of brandishing whips mm -hmm. most of the time. 
And interestingly, in the draft script, they actually do go into the water. Both Tom and the Doctor go into the water, but looking at the amount of scum that is on there, yeah. it's probably a good thing they didn't do it. Yeah. Um, in that draft script, the Dalek has the famous We Are the Masters of Earth as its first line as well, which they opted not to do. There's no light flashing on that prop, so presumably they... Was someone inside it? Well, it's a good question. I don't think there was... I don't think so. It's it's certainly swaying a bit in the water, so, so there's no one holding it steady. Yeah. That's a pickup shot from much later in the film, and that is location shot down by the church. But there's a lot of those little pickup shots where they've added more Daleks into the film from a shoot much later on. It's odd that they went to such effort to incorporate more Daleks into it when the publicity surrounding the film sort of played down the Daleks and focused on the Robomen, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Actually, quite a big set, this Rebel base. I wonder if the Web of Fear took inspiration from, from this depiction of a, a headquarters in the underground. I think that light's supposed to be like a motion detector rather than a, a doorbell. Mm. Well, the door the door opens on its own later on, doesn't it? When um, when David and Doctor Who leave because mm. they don't see Susan's message because the door opens by itself. In in Sabotsky's draft, there's a there's like a spy hole. So when you press the button in the uh, the secret button, uh, the little uh, hole opens and an eye peers out to check who it is before <laughs> the door's allowed to open. It's a nice detail that the um, set is curved in the background to give some sense of the London Underground tunnels. I think Godfrey Quigley does a good job as Dortmund. I've always found the character to be one of the weak links in the TV version, but here he's it's a very strong portrayal and you can understand why he is the leader of this band of survivors. Her line's dubbed here. Louise, she doesn't say that. And I tried to work out what she did say and I I couldn't. Neither could I. (laughs) (laughs) And it's not in the script, is it? It's not in the draft anyway. I haven't got the uh, screenplay. I reckon she says, but what about our two friends outside? Oh, well done. Loads of her dialogue is overdubbed. Mm. And it's it's remarkable, really. I mean, she has so little dialogue throughout this film. It's embarrassing. Yeah. And there's times when she should naturally just say something and doesn't. And she just kind of looks (laughs) blankly at people rather than... There you go. (laughs) (laughs) She could have a line there. Too much to ask. On the walls there, you've got some new posters covering up the old ones to disguise that we've seen this part of the set before. Ah. It was the same place they encountered Ray Brooks in the tunnels before. It's interesting, Sobotsky's kind of moved the players around in the in, in the draft script and then in the final script, changing uh, which characters are involved in which set pieces. You know, like in the TV version, it's Jenny and Barbara who escape in the van. And Barbara becomes Louise, who's on the saucer in this. And it's Dortmund and Susan in the van. And just all these kinds of retaining all of the vital elements, but just moving all the bits around on the board. Mm. Of course, this scene here is uh, is virtually uh, the identical set to the uh, where the TARDIS lands. Very cleverly, just slightly changed around just to give it the impression that it's somewhere completely different. And certainly for years, I never realised it was the same place. It was a completely different set. Mm. But there's so many buildings that match that you can pick out uh, something, the, the Mary Bell shop and what have you, that's all the same. Mm. It's a fantastic set. So we're coming up to our big stump piece here mm. uh, with Eddie Powell. Uh, originally, he it wasn't going to be high up. Uh, he was just going to run off and ended up being cornered by a group of Daleks and then killed. Because obviously they made it something far more interesting. 
and obviously for him, far more painful. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Dalek that actually shoots up at him is is one of the two that we know still exist today as well. There's a there aren't there don't seem to be many, but that's one of them. It's surprising because there were so many props made for this film, weren't there? How many was it? Uh, we we've counted nineteen, which seems like uh, an odd number. Because uh, why wouldn't you commission twenty? Why would why would you do nineteen? But when you actually think about it, it actually works out quite quite well because you've got, you've got eight commissioned from Shaw Shawcraft, to which similar to the first film, there was eight in the first film. Um, a further six dummies, which we're not one hundred percent sure who actually made those at the moment. Um, it could have been Shawcraft, possibly they were done at Shepperton. There's certainly a, a photo that shows. Uh, a Dalek being worked on at Shepperton. Um, and then we have the five that uh, were drafted in from the Curse of the Daleks play. So add that together, you get 19. Mm. <laughs> so that sort of adds, it adds together nicely. 19 props. Surely, surely there must be some more of them out there to find. There's a nice colour palette in this film of uh, blue, red, gold. And it's in the the lights and it's in the the buttons on the panels and it's in the the that cabling in the background mm. and of course it's in the Dalek props themselves and all the metal tones are similar to the first film aren't they the metal mm. city Fleming really makes good use of the color though doesn't he in yeah Dalek films you know he he makes things really pop out uh, and he's also very aware of the format that he's filming in as well. Um, because you have a, a lot of things which are constructed almost to fit a widescreen format. Mm. Um, it, it's one of the lovely things I think about the about the Dalek ship is that it's almost a widescreen ship, isn't it? Yes. You know, yeah, and yeah. it is it is there filling the entire frame as it as it mm. comes over. Um, but there's lots of things he does throughout the throughout this particular film where you look at it and he's he's very definitely lined things up uh, in a in a horizontal linear mm. way, uh, in order to sort of really make full use of his frame. Mm. It's, it's funny this escape in um, it doesn't exist at all in Nation's draft. Uh, Whitaker wrote in all the business with the the lenses and the lights, um, and then Sabotsky in his draft script had created a. A, a, a more elegant version of Whitaker's lenses and lights thing, where the Doctor finds this sort of uh, this this lens that he can position, aim like a laser, and he points it at a little trigger above the door, and it releases the door switch. That's probably one of the best examples of the efficiency of these movies, isn't it? How something that in the TV version lasts for minutes mm. is dispensed with in you know, a matter of 30 seconds. Yeah. Well, I, th I think there's a real economy of storytelling here, though. I mean, this is, what, 80 minutes? But it doesn't actually feel like they've lost all that much out of the story. No. <laughs> uh, you know, the story actually uh, rumbles along at quite a nice rate. There's, you know, uh, and because you've got action set pieces coming in fairly frequently, it keeps the pace up all the way through. Mm. It's a remarkable job they've done constricting the story down. Mm. I like the way he says that and then seems to immediately go into his hiding place. <laughs> I need a couple of minutes alone with my bombs. <laughs> <laughs> it's another uh, example here of making sure that uh, Louise doesn't get any lines. <laughs> In in the TV version, obviously, it's Barbara who mm. comes up with this idea. And in Sabotsky's script, it's Susan. And then they shift it to Dortmund. Yeah, they think, we can't have a woman having a good idea. What a ridiculous notion. These helmets are terrible, though, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the sunglasses. It's the sunglasses yeah, that ruins it, it. Yeah. Now, one of the things I wanted to do uh, was, like I did with the first film commentary, was... Uh, make reference to where the episode endings were 
uh, and you just can't. It just falls apart because after uh, after the robotizing scene, which would have been the end of episode two on screen, all of the scenes are so moved around that you can't make any useful comparison. Things are happening 10 minutes later in the film than they did on screen and, and everything is shuffled. So once the attack, rebel attack on the source is over, there's there's just no like for like scene matching. So it's a much more sophisticated adaptation of the original script than the first film. Those coloured lights on the walls always seem to be flashing in a different pattern. Mm. I assume they're driven by a, a sequencer rather than some bloke just pressing buttons. <laughs> Why is it the Daleks seem to feel the need to label everything? <laughs> I, I mean, they've got a machine there with a big sign on it saying total power. <laughs> I, I mean, it's it, it really seems to be sort of... I mean, and their disposal shoot has disposal shoot written on it. <laughs> it's an intimidation tactic for their prisoners yeah. as they know what's going to happen yeah. to them. <laughs> these uh, Perspex domes that they're using, these were actually sold off as part of the Shepparton auction uh, in 1974. And the saucer was sold as well, wasn't it? The saucer actually was sold on the third day. It was a five-day auction, lot number 1,250. Described in the catalogue as model flying saucer, four foot diameter, uh, sold on Wednesday, the 2nd of October, 1974. And it was actually bought by Zoran Perisic. Uh, and Zoran Perisic was the guy who developed the Zoptic system, which they used on Superman. It's how they got Superman to fly. I have uh, in recent years spoken to Zoran. Um, he bought not only the saucer, but he bought a... Uh, fighter plane from Doctor Strange Love as well, and he bought them both in order to test his optic system. Oh wow! Um, the plane he still has, the saucer he has lost track of. How do you lose <laughs> track of a four foot wooden saucer? I don't know. Has he got a lot of that sort of thing? <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know. He um, he did lend it at one period to Matt Irving. Matt believes that he borrowed it because he needed to do a demonstration on Tomorrow's World. But I'm sure if that has actually happened, someone would have spotted it. Matt then kept the saucer in the storeroom of the Astronomical Society of Harangay, of which he is a member uh, in Alexander Palace. And then Zoran asked for the model back because he needed to do some more test work. So Matt gave it back to him. Shortly before half of Alexander Palace burnt down, along with all the Astronomy Society materials, wow. um, in July 1980. So it was returned back to Zoran, but Zoran has no idea what happened to it <laughs> from that point on. He has asked his assistants, he has asked the people who's worked for him, but no one seems to know what happened to it. So after July 1980. We don't actually know what what happened. He wanted it back because he needed to do some tests on a further Zoptic system that he was doing, um, and he needed a model to be able to use for that. And he says that that occurred sometime after he finished work on Superman 2, but before he went off to do a truly dreadful film in LA called Megaforce, <laughs> which was nominated for three Golden Raspberry Awards. <laughs> wow. Wow. Let's hope it's out there somewhere. There's an edition of the Granada television series Cinema, uh, which actually focused on Shepard and Studios um, just before the auction happened. And it's got a sequence about a minute and a half long and shows the saucer in that um, that I've seen at the BFI. It, it is mute, but but it is there. Apparently it appeared on John Croden's Newsround as well, but that edition no longer exists. And rather frustratingly, there is also a 1967 edition of cinema that has a full-length interview with Peter Cushing, done only a year after this particular film. Wow. But they don't have a viewing copy of it, and they don't want to make one because it's um, restricted access to the, to the negative. Oh. Oh. Outrageous. But of course, what, what we're also missing is the subsequent return a year later of Doctor Who on radio with Peter Cushing. So the, the plan to do an independent radio series for which they did record the pilot and copies were made, but now, as far as we are aware, no longer survive. There were certainly two that were knocking around the BBC because we've actually got the um, reports for when they made them, but sadly, no copy of it survives. It was a single pilot episode, lasted about 19, 20 minutes, written by Malcolm Hulk, 
And it wasn't connected to the movies, was it? Other than it being Cushing, it was a... no, no, not at all. I asked someone to ask Roberta whether or not she had been involved with it at all, and she said she wasn't. Oh. So it looks like they probably would have recast Susan. We don't know who any of the other cast members are, apart from one I can't remember the name of. <laughs> um, but he uh, he certainly remembers doing it. He certainly remembers that Cushing did it. Wow. Lost media. Uh, now, now, as they as they jump off, notice as they jump off, this is now not Cushing. No. And then this shot is repeated from a different angle because you can see him going behind the wall again. <laughs> mm. It's never very clear there that that's where Wyler sustains his injury. He's supposed to be sh- sh- caught in a shootout between the Robomen and the Rebels, uh, and he injures his leg, but you never really see that. His his limp just suddenly appears. Now, this is this scene's shot in in two sessions. That shot is done much later than all of the human work. That's an early shot. The, uh, the upper floor of the shops on the left here um, were dismantled and reused for some of the pickup shots later on. Mm-hmm. And this is actually the roads around Shepparton, isn't it? It is, yeah. That's the reception, I think, for the studios on the left. Or it is now, anyway. It wasn't at the time. And supposedly, later on when he takes this off, he's still got his coat on underneath this. <laughs> <laughs> now this, uh, in the draft script, starts the lengthy uh, battle with the alligators. Yeah, it's one of um, several things that's uh, that was in the original television series that Sabotsky did put in the script, mm. but was subsequently taken out. So, um, so yes, there was going to be a, a lengthy sequence where they made their way under the city mm. and chased by two alligators, chased up a, a metal um, ladder, which then started to give way mm. before they uh, before they come out. Sounds like a wise idea that they dropped that, right? Otherwise, you could have been a very sort of rubbery crocodile in there or alligator or whatever. Yeah. Very much like the shark in the Batman movie <laughs> of the time. Well, that kind of stuff wouldn't have been removed um, as a result of Cushing being ill during the shoot, would it? That would have been excised before then. Well, that's a, that is an int- that's an interesting thought, Reese. Um because we, we've got coming up in, in a bit. It, at the moment, we're seeing um, Tom as a rover man, and he spends the next few minutes disguising himself as a rover man. Now, that doesn't happen in Sabotsky's original script. He, he never does any of that. Then we have all this weird comedy scene <laughs> with, with the eating, and it had crossed my mind whether or not they had originally intended to do it that to a sequence, mm. but abandoned it because Cushing fell ill uh, and everything got delayed by a couple of weeks. As they always do with these sort of films, they go ahead and shoot everything that they can around an actor not being there. Mm. Um, so they were doing everything else. And was it simply a case that they said, okay, we've got too much to pick up on. We need to take out that scene because Cushing's simply not available and he's not been well. So let's put in something else, uh, and you end up with this weird little yeah. comedy comedy sequence of them sitting down and eating sweeties. Yeah, it's really not good, is it? I mean, it's a low point of the film. Oh, I always enjoyed it. You're insane. <laughs> yeah, I found it funny when, when I was a kid. It always made me la- always made me laugh. <laughs> oh my god, no, you're all wrong. Watch the um, Roboman on the left excluding cribbins on the far left um he just can't do any of these maneuvers at all (laughs) when he's required to turn here he gets it completely wrong faces the wrong way (laughs) doesn't know what he's up to i think i think what doesn't help with this is that it's a single unbroken shot which makes it feel even more awkward and stilted although apparently i'm in the minority for thinking it's (laughs) awkward and stilted so what do i know I mean, it could have been just a scene that they put in 
for Cribbins as a comedy moment. You know, he'd obviously done um, his two Carry On films prior to this, Carry On Jack and Carry On Spying. Um, 1962, he'd obviously had his three um, big hits, uh, all, all top 30 hits with his, with his comedy-based songs. So perhaps they just thought this was a nice sort of comedy moment for him. But it, it just sort of, it really sticks out from everything else, doesn't it? Yeah. It's the sort of thing you could imagine Ian from the first movie being involved with. Yeah, it's not a million miles from that door scene, is it? It's this poor chap sitting next to Cribbing to <laughs> His helmet's all over the place. <laughs> it's completely askew. <laughs> That's my favourite part of it. Yeah, so at, at, at that point in the draft, Tom meets the replacement for Larry, who is a female called Laurie, and they actually get captured and locked up in the scene where um, Tom and Louise are in uh, in like a crawl space, <laughs> which they say they're going to be, they could be there for days, which um, the mind boggles. Uh, <laughs> but that, w- that would have been replacing the, the prison cell scenes, I think. Um, if you look at the top right there, you can see that the walls of Dortmund's cabin don't actually extend up to the ceiling. Yes. So it's, seems chiefly to be an office of vanity. <laughs> so this scene originally, Dalton was going to suggest, um, I think as they do in the um, television series, that they're going to go to the transport museum mm. rather than what he says here, which is just picking up a van somewhere that's lying about in London. Um but it's ultimately Barbara who leaves the note rather than Susan. Mm. And rather than scrawling it on the door, she actually writes it down on a piece of paper, which will later get blown away as the <laughs> Doctor and David return, which is why they don't see it. Which is somewhat less silly than them just completely failing to notice this. Yeah, it's very contrived, isn't it? Yeah. That they don't ever look towards the door until they leave and it's already opened. Mm. So you missed all of the uh, the alligator action there. That's another pickup shot done late in the film. There was a batch of, I think, four shots with the same corner, same piece of rubble, and they did a couple of night shots and a couple of day shots and a couple of pyrotechnics, and they get spliced constantly throughout the film, those two Daleks coming around that corner. The fact that they were shooting a lot of the scenes you know, local to them on the Shepperton site probably gave them more flexibility than you'd have with a traditional location shoot where you would have to meticulously plan all the places you were going to use beforehand. Yeah. They could presumably remount quite spontaneously as well as necessary. It's incredible just how many uh, how many shots they can make out of the Shepperton grounds, you know, how, how, how they used the whole area so well. It must have saved a huge amount for the budget. Yeah, it's really efficiently done. Mm. Yeah, it was a bigger budget than the first film, but not not by a huge amount, I don't think. No, I think uh, it, it, this was one hundred and eighty thousand. I think mm. the, the budget on this one. So I think that equates in modern terms to about three and a half million. Of course, they've got all that sugar puffs money <laughs> at their disposal. Or were they paid in sugar puffs? <laughs> I was looking the other day at that uh, interview that we have with Gordon Fleming from um, A Whole Scene Going. He talks about that at the time there are so many people doing what he calls message pictures, but he likes doing entertainment. And he says there's nothing wrong with doing entertainment. And I think that's really what these two films are. They're good, solid fun. Everyone looks like they're having a good time, don't mm-hmm. they, doing it? Yeah. I don't know why, but it, I never noticed this is the robotizing chamber. The robotizing chamber and the food where Bernard Cribbins does his comedy routine, it's all the same room. Yeah, they pretty much exclusively shoot from one side for the robotizing stuff and the other side for the food stuff. You can see the stage hands in the background there chucking plates yeah. onto the conveyor belt. I never liked the fact that it's lit so brightly in the in the depths of that wall, it should surely be dark in there. It also looks like Louise 
time times the switch as well. She's waiting for a cue to put to pull the switch. Yeah, she hovers her hand around it for several seconds before actually pushing it down. So she's obviously timing it with someone else who's turning the lights off. There he is, all jacketed. Who knew he could fit it under there? He must have been warm. It's bigger on the inside. <laughs> They'd have been sweating in those, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> He's got he's got a shirt, a waistcoat, a coat, and then a bin bag over the top of that. It's insane. <laughs> but oh, come on, surely one of the two of them would have seen that message. It's so contrived. Now I'm going to be looking forward to seeing the new um, Blu-ray version because I'm hoping we might be able to read these notes a little clearer. Oh, oh yeah. Mm. Um, he's actually got on there, no news of Dalek in Golders Green area. Nearest point of something was at Highgate. Dalek's going south of the border to Westgate. Something Dalek's reported as massing on Clapham Common. <laughs> the, the, the slaves are reported to be following something, the Daleks in Torquay, and the slaves are something. Oh, very um, good. I like it. So it might be even clearer on the new version. Good attention to detail from That's the brilliant, yeah. props department because sometimes some of the uh, the paperwork stuck up in the TARDIS in the first movie looks suspiciously like it squiggles, script pages, and things. <laughs> oh right, yeah, yeah. So we've got a great big action sequence here that we're missing. Um, so in the original script, uh, the Daleks actually turn up outside of the hideout oh. with a device that's detecting them inside. The, the device is very much like the um, the seismic detector, I thought, in the chase. Yeah, it, it looks like it. Something like that. They blow open the doors, and then there's a, a, a big fight on the platform of the underground station. Uh, and the Doctor throws, I think he throws a couple of the bombs at two Daleks, and it stops them, and then they push them onto another couple of Daleks before they escape. He is explosives mad in that draft script isn't he the <laughs> doctor he is chucking bombs left right and center filming the uh, the saucer model against the real sky really helps to sell the illusion here doesn't it yes it's just a, a pity you can still see the strings <laughs> and of course as you say in the um, in the original script uh we have this girl called laurie um who teams up with tom at this point and and by this point, Craddock, who's been robotized, has actually died. Uh, Laurie kills Craddock when he's um, throt throttling Tom, mm. and they dump him down the waste disposal ship. <laughs> um, so whereas Craddock comes up, turns up much later down the down the bomb shaft in this, he's um, he's actually dispatched a lot earlier off. Mm. These these garages are actual working garages on on the Shepperton site, and. Uh, they are actually spotted in the background of the photos of uh, from the first movie promotion with the Daleks being loaded onto the truck uh, to go to make their trip to Cannes. You see the back end of them rather than the, rather than where they come out of from here, but, the, but it is the same garages. Are they prefab army buildings? Is there a reason they're that arch shape? Yeah, they're apparently called Romney Huts, these buildings. Uh, the distinctive curved prefab steel uh originating from the Second World War. And of course, uh, the bit of set here that Dortmund's on is is part of the big saucer set. This bit's added later. So we're, we're back in the same location again, studio-wise. I remember we, we scrutinised this for so long because the ground is some of the most convincing indoor studio floor ground. The sort of puddles, aren't there? Yeah, there are. It's got puddles, it looks like dirt, it's, it looks like it's been rained on. It's so weird, I, I can't fathom it. More, more convincing than the dummy of Dortmund, then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's touch and go. And of course here they, they race onto the famous street set, which we've seen several times in the movie already, which I yeah. didn't realise for a long, long time that this was the same place. But yeah, it's, It starts with the robbery, doesn't it? It's yeah, the, the robbery, the, the opening to the underground station they've just mm. passed. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's so well done. You just, unless you analyse it for a long, long time, you just don't realise it's the same place. It's fun to think that the robbery that Tom foils 
is meant to be the exact location where they escape in the van 50 years later or 100 years or 150 take your pick and the, the gold the gold dalek here is is one of the uh, is one of the curse of the daleks props it's it's the black dalek from the curse of the daleks hmm. repainted uh, there are a few stock control desks in front of them and for this reverse angle shot they've just turned the desks around 180 degrees and used that same backdrop ah. I'm wondering where they did that high angle shot from do you think they could have gone up to the top of the church and done that St Mary's Church I th think that sounds right did we postulate that, John? I can't remember. We, we did. We yeah. We have. That's one of the things we thought about. But because we, St Mary's Church is here in the background, isn't it? Just, yeah. Just behind the trees. Yeah. We were we were never sure there was that sort of lane anywhere near near the church, though. That's the only thing that sort of threw us off. Right. When you look at a map from above, it's sort of fairly standard. Um, yeah. Studio streets around there, where the car park is, very close to that. In the draft script. It's it's not just Wyler and Susan in the van. It's Barbara as well, and a whole bunch of resistance fighters. So it's pretty crammed in there. Camera ducks down here to make sure you don't see the mansion house in the background. Again, it's beautifully used location work on the grounds of Shepperton. I mean, it's all like two minutes from stage H where the rest of the film's shot. Yeah, this this all looks like. Just fields in the middle of in the middle of the countryside, but it's yeah. literally yards from the studio. This effect shot coming up is a bit ropey. Mm. Uh, the multiple elements involved don't really fit together seamlessly. Yeah, you would first shoot the background plate of the exploding van, then the saucer on the blue screen or green screen. They would have used that footage to create a mask of the saucer silhouette which would be combined with the saucer footage to isolate the saucer from the blue background, and you would combine it with the background footage of the exploding van to create a void where the saucer should be. You would then combine those two pieces of footage using an optical printer to give you the saucer overlaid on the background. Then this would be combined with that hand-animated ray blast. So it's a process which involves a number of steps, and at each stage you're introducing more grain losing detail and the background has ended up looking noticeably less sharp the lighting doesn't quite match between the saucer and the background and the death ray is sort of semi-transparent so overall it's not particularly convincing yeah. which is a shame because the saucer is so impressive and well used pretty much everywhere else yes. in the film i really like their um their little relationship i don't mean that in a uh, inappropriate way now this this is bizarre I wondered, is this meant to be like the Indiana Jones Marco Polo map? Are we supposed to be watching <laughs> their journey? Is this is this a placeholder? It's ADR, isn't it? It's very disconnected from from the scene with Cushing and Brooks now. The map the map is now gone. They were below Watford when the conversation starts. And then he says, how far left? And he says, we've got about three miles to go. Mm -hmm. So that suggests that the, the movement of the pencil across the page is the speed at which they're travelling. It doesn't make <laughs> any sense. The, the remains of the bridge that the uh, rover man was shot from, does that? they still, still, still exist, actually. I think the actual bridge is gone, but the huge concrete blocks are still in place. We could go and ceremonially dive off it. <laughs> <laughs> or steal it. They had the, there's a chap on, um, on YouTube Who's, who's visited the location in the last couple of years and spotted them. So they, they are still there. Yeah, I, I went up there many years ago with some off-screen shots <laughs> and trying to work out where across the River Ash everything was. And then I suddenly realised I was standing on the bridge, <laughs> the one next to where the cottage is. Um, and, yeah, and there in the, in the undergrowth was all the remains of the stone plinths yeah. that you see going past. Yeah. There was a there was a nice bit uh, in the draft script where Tom and Laurie were imprisoned in essentially the same kind of cell that Doctor Who was imprisoned at the start. And Tom remembered what Doctor Who did to escape. And he used the same technique to break out of the cell. And then they get to the disposal chute and jump down the disposal chute to get out the saucer. 
It's a bit of a strange decision to hold them in a prison cell, which is explicitly designed to be a test. <laughs> yeah, and not not very hard escape room either, because there's one device in it, and that's the device that opens the door. Yeah, I had an escape room yesterday, and it was harder than that prison cell, so I'd have been robotized. In this shot coming up in a second, um, you can see one of the other Curse of the Daleks props. Yeah. It's uh, the one with the scissor-like pincer. Ah. It's interesting that there's a distinct difference in the build quality between the uh, the Shawcraft made Daleks and anything that was drafted in later. Yeah. And this whole scene was supposed to take place in the mine workings uh, underground at this point. Because it, it goes directly into the mine, doesn't it? Yeah. But they, they jump out of the saucer and they're straight into the mine. Yeah. There's no Philip Maddox stuff at all. And of course, this particular scene in the original draft being done down the mine, it's at this point that they bring in the slither. Mm. Um, because in the original original draft, the slither is there. So you not only have the, the sewers and the alligators from the original television series, you have the slither as well, mm. which has been described as being made out of metal, but it doesn't give it any further description than that. No. Metal and glowing eyes, I think, is all we get, isn't it? Yeah. And then you get the pursuit of... Uh, of um, of Tom and, Lo and Laurie by the Slither. Mm. Um, so it's, it's interesting what Sabotsky had originally taken from the original series mm. and what he chose not to. But as, um, uh, as you said, it, you've got this strange thing where in the script he doesn't include uh, all the stuff with Broccoli isn't there at all. Yeah. But it is there in the original story mm. with um, with Ashton, and it's something they decide to bring in and add to it. They, they take out the elements that they've already used from the story that they don't want to use anymore, and they put another one back in. Mm. What was David Whittaker's involvement with the movie? Because I've seen him given credit for some part of the script. His credit is solely as a result of producing the final TV script. Right. So it basically, because the TV script is written by Terry Nation and David Whittaker, uh, Milton Sabotsky is adapting a script by those two as a pair. And I don't know what, I mean, because it's credited as, as from a story by Terry Nation with additional material by David Whittaker. So I think that's a sort of retrospective analysis of how it's done. As far as I'm aware, Whittaker had no direct involvement with any yeah, because I've often seen it reported that uh, Whitaker was invited to contribute additional material, that kind of thing. Because there isn't any. Mm. There's no. There's no material in the film that isn't in one or other version of the TV serial, either Nation's original draft or Whitaker's rewritten version. So I can't, you know, unless it's a uh, Unless it's a polish of the dialogue, I can't see why Whitaker would have an additional material credit. Is this stuff filmed in that same hut? I can never quite figure it out. I think so, yeah. I spent a while today trying to work it out. I'm pretty sure it is because that building is so old and there's so many cobwebs and dust and nooks and crannies and the stove looks real. I don't think that's a studio set. I could be wrong. But mm. I think also when you can see out of the windows and doors, it's it seems to have real depth outside. Yeah, because when you see the Dalek outside, yeah. that's definitely outdoors. Yeah. And one of the small things that I th think convinced me is here the food is steaming. And yet, uh, Roberta Tovey eats it straight away. So it can't be mm -hmm. that hot that it's 
it's boiling. I think it's steaming because they're actually outside and the door on the right is open. Otherwise, surely she'd have burnt her mouth. Yeah, and this was what? February? February, March? So I think that's reasonable temperature food in an exterior environment. I'll buy that. The shot in the trailer uh, is missing the matte painting. So you get a nice uh, bit of analysis of the the view of the landscape before Gerald Lyons' picture was optically inserted. So does that suggest it was produced later? He recalled there being some issues with the the main saucer map painting, as in he wasn't happy with the results because he only had design drawings to work mm. from rather than the the full finished model. Ah, so basically you're saying that saucer is much more accurate, maybe because it was done later. Mm. Ah, yeah, good point. Coming up here, I think we've got some more dubbed dialogue uh, from Cushing, which doesn't quite match the lip movements. Yeah. So this is this cave is like a Victorian folly sort of thing, or a... There was a name for it, like a not like a shell cave, but um, just an oddity left over in Littleton Manor's grounds, wasn't it? Yes, it's, it's something like that. It's, it's not there anymore. Uh, it's the same guy I was referring to earlier has also been, he, he made his way to this point, so it's quite hard to get to now. Uh, but he made his way here, and the trees, obviously, they're, they're still there, and he, he, he picks out the trees in his video. Um but the actual whatever you want to call it is 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 gone. So uh That's a shame. But it's just in a a weird sort of little gully um between two fields when it, when you look at it on the map. Mm. It's a strange place to have it. So whether it was just something for, for animals to to feed in or something like that. Yeah. Yes, you're right, it could be. That would be logical. Good, good review of the reservoir in the background, the embankment. Not entirely sure why he threatens him there. Hmm. Just in his nature to be unpleasant. <laughs> He's great, Philip Maddock. He's just oozes menace, doesn't he? Yeah. This is fun here when he tells them to to go in as if it's a a long tunnel system or cave <laughs> network but you can see them move to the left of picture and then just stop and they just stand <laughs> awkwardly next to each other cuddled up on the edge of frame here we go just go and stand there awkwardly next to each other off your pop so does he stand there watching them all night yes yeah doesn't doesn't let them sleep or lie down <laughs> I love a good proper night shoot. Yes. No day for night nonsense here. Yeah. yeah. Do we, do we know why why uh, sorry I forget the name of this actress why why she was overdubbed for all of it? Sheila Stiefel. Stiefel. That's yeah. Do we know why she was dubbed? There's a lot of overdubbing in this film. I don't know whether it's necessarily personal. It could be simply because they they recorded it outside. Yeah. I think they missed a trick by not giving her a, a box of sugar puffs to, <laughs> to produce from that bag. <laughs> Excuse me, to tell them tell them what exactly? <laughs> I can never quite work out why Wyla silently wakes Susan up to sneak out. And then flings the curtain aside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks great in the dark, doesn't it? It does, yeah. That Dalek. It's a nice dent on the dome on the right hand side of the dome, so you can identify that prop. Wasn't quite what I meant when when I said it looks great in the dark, mm. Gav. <laughs> it's got a lovely dent. <laughs> the, illu the the illuminated eye really works well, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, in the in the half light. 
know, Eileen Way is playing the same old woman from 100,000 BC. <laughs> she's now a very old woman. Yeah, she's 100,000 years old. That's a fact. This musical cue is um, like Native American drum music. It's really odd. Every time I hear it, I think, am I missing another in joke? <laughs> is there another joke like Takata and Fugue that I'm just not au fait with? This used to really upset me as a kid when uh, <laughs> he kicks the food over unnecessarily. I thought, oh, he's he's really evil because that's so unkind and so unnecessary. This is your definition of evil, is it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like a rubbish tip on the right there, isn't it? Where all the old Littleton garbage used to get dumped. Look at that. That's outrageous. That's so upsetting. And he's leaving a fire burning in the wood as well, so he's very bad. He's a lunatic. Yeah, wouldn't that attract attention? Big plume of smoke. Well, I always kind of thought that was why he was doing it, was to to extinguish the fire. But, you, yeah, you're not supposed to do that. It makes smoke billow and you attract but wolves and Daleks. This is odd, isn't it? Him re replacing Roger Avon. It seems the same character, but this actor has now taken over the part. Yeah. And and it gets even weirder in a minute, as I'll point out. <laughs> it's funny that uh, David basically just disappears because he has no arc with Susan in this. He gets very little to do. I think his final dialogue is in the... It's in the hut, isn't it? Yeah, it's in yeah. the hut, yeah. And he basically says something like... He goes off with Louise. Yeah, mm. I'll, go, I'll, yeah I'll look after Louise. And I then think, vanishes, yeah. I think you do see him on location. but Oh, that's right, yes, yeah, when they come mm. out. And it's because his role in the original was to escort Susan out of the TV series. So some of the kind of, like I was saying, moving these pieces around is not wholly successful in the end because you've got some of these swaps taking place, like you were saying, Reese. where um, is it Wells suddenly is replaced with Connolly? That's it, yeah. For no particular reason. That bald guy, he has more lines than Louise in this film. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. This is where the second part of my 8mm Wharton Doctor Who, Dark Invasion, Earth 2150 AD cine film kicked in. Oh, <laughs> nice. So they... they, they Part one ends with them going up the ramp into the spaceship, and then they miss out this entire middle section. <laughs> wow! And then come in, come in on this <laughs> particular scene, and then it's bits and pieces. So it's a cut down version. Did you ever try and play your soundtrack recording with the the silent film? Yes, uh, yes. Me and my friend Nigel, because I, I got the film, but we didn't have any cine equipment. So, uh, <laughs> but, but his dad did. So we took it round there, and I took my recording for the film, and we tried to match various bits up. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. So this, uh, in the draft script, this is the debut of the Purple Dalek that oversees the mine operations, later disappointingly changed to the Black Dalek. Now, of course, they'd established a Black Dalek in the first film, hadn't they? Yeah. I wonder, though, whether or not, because obviously this script would have had to gone, go past... Terry Nation. Yeah. Mm. They were very hot on not allowing anything other than certain official Dalek colours. They got very stroppy over some of the merchandise that was being done at the time and the colour schemes that were being chosen. And I do wonder whether or not they would have said, no, you can't have a purple Dalek. Mm. There aren't any purple Daleks. Sounds believable. So they had to stick with the black one. Yeah. Well, it's strange that they have a red one since Daleks can't see red. <laughs> as we well know which means they can't see the bomb either mm -hmm. <laughs> put it into place now of course you made the uh, comment Gav in um, on the commentary for the first film about the Dalek writing and we have it here as well good point mm. uh, it's up It's up there in the corner oh yes um, so we've we've got Dalek keys yeah. uh, written on this particular plot explaining map so they so the Daleks drew up this map it's um Worth pointing out that Broccoli, for all his sins, um, is the reason they defeat the Daleks. It's Broccoli who procures that map, and without the map, they can't formulate the plan to divert the bomb to save the planet. So, he's the real hero, in my eyes. Yeah, how does he arrange getting that map? 
does he go to the Daleks and say, I need a map to yes. snare these people into a trap? Ah. I think so. And the Daleks are like, well, should we should we do a fake map? And he's like, no, <laughs> do, do a completely accurate one. And the Daleks are like, well, is it possible they'll use a completely accurate map to defeat us? Nah. nah. <laughs> Be fine. All of this stuff about diverting the bomb off and magnetism destroying the Daleks is not there in the original script. It is so boring in his <laughs> original script compared to what we get. It's interesting that he, I mean, presumably he wasn't working with multiple writers, that, that he could change his script so significantly without needing the input of other people. It's so weird. Because all of the Slither stuff is excised from the film, there's no connective tissue between how those two characters go <laughs> from the shack. They're just suddenly in the mine. And this is this is a service that Broccoli is selling for gold rings and diamond watches and things. These uh, mine working scenes, they're all using the same one piece of tunnel. It's one length, mm. and they shoot back and forth along it with uh, redressed scenery. It's funny that the real lighting for this scene is obviously well above mm. the uh, yeah. prop lights, which is really incongruous. Uh, and then they use that hole not only to shoot with the camera, but for the people to hide in. So where is the ceiling of this mine shaft <laughs> yeah. really supposed to be? Because you can see the beams of it. It doesn't make any sense. Basically, you've got one long corridor with T a T-junction at either end, and this is a sort of U-turn that comes off one of those T-junctions and goes along to the shaft. A lot of it is built from reclaimed uh, fire-damaged wood. You'll see an awful lot of the timbers are completely black and charred. There's one there, right there, where he's got his arm on. Um, and, and you see that over and over again as they're all fire-damaged, so presumably something like a a Tudor timber frame house or a ship or something burnt down or a windmill. I love the editing of this. Uh, every time the lights completely drop, the shots, the shot cuts. Yeah. It's really sinister, that. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's another fire damaged upright there, you see, oh, on yes. the left. There's a lot of it, and on the right as well. There's loads of it. Presumably cheap, cheap timber that you couldn't use anywhere else because it's not structurally sound. So Sobotsky's original plan was to follow more closely the line of the television series. Mm. So uh, in his script, uh, Tom is menaced by the slither, and to get away from the slither, he comes across the bomb capsule and gets inside it. <laughs> And the Daleks then start lowering it down the, the mine shaft um, on a cable or something. Um, so all, all the stuff that Tom does from this moment on isn't in the original uh, script. Mm -hmm. There's such a much more elegant solution to all of the plot threads. Mm. I really like that moment where when you review it, knowing how it plays out, Doctor Who is clearly aware of what's going on and he's it's just a really subtle yeah. um moment to uh, uh broccoli where he says is it safe the, the, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about widescreen shots that this is really filling the frame isn't it mm. you know yeah. you, you've you've got all your baddies lined up <laughs> uh in a row yeah panned and scanned this was rubbish <laughs> And I would guess they probably fed the lines for the um, exterminators under the soil. Mm. So they're, they're feeding them away from the empty casings. Yeah. There was a nice line uh, in the draft script where Sabotsky was trying to reconcile what the Daleks were doing. He added a line for Doctor Who saying, the Earth is a strange environment for them, meaning the Daleks. But if they could move the Earth to a position close to their planet, they could discard their machines and live on the Earth. That's what they're doing at the mine. Something mm. that will move the Earth out of its orbit and into the environment of the Daleks' own planets. So 
essentially they're saying it's terraforming the earth is the uh, motivation for moving the planet in this story. This bit of footage is noticeably grainier than everything else, uh, which suggests it's from a dupe negative. Oh. wonder why that would be. Now, th this is something I think is remarkable about this set. These walkways are really narrow. Yeah. And these guys in dark casings can't actually see too clearly where they're going. Mm. Um, so I think they are extremely brave to, mm, <laughs> doing yeah. what they're doing. Because uh, sometimes they they actually get really quite close to the edge um, of the of these walkways and upper level. Yeah, and they're completely completely flat, aren't they? There's no ridge on the side to sort of give them a hint that they're getting too close to the edge. A lot of the stuff that we have here in the control room, uh, mine control room, um, we now of course have the very lovely behind the scenes material from mm. um, a whole scene going that turned up a few years ago, uh, including that interview with um, Gordon Fleming. Um, Jason was Jason Fleming was really excited when I sent that to him because mm. um, he he doesn't have a whole lot from uh, uh, of his dad's. Right. So to actually see something of his his dad mm. talking was um, was something special for him. Oh, that's nice. That's lovely. I like that the Daleks uh, manipulators are moving the wheels on the control panel to suggest that that's responsible for the the, the bomb's movement. And I like how their eye stalks all follow the bomb as it mm. goes overhead. I don't like that eye stalk pinging up in the air there. That looks bad. Do <laughs> retake of that. Sorry, Gordon. That uh, Dalek in the background there, the top half, is the, the same one that shoots the prisoner from the roof earlier in the film. Oh. It really irritates me in that one episode of Dalek Invasion of Earth where they seem to start using the eye stalks to indicate the speech. Yeah, it just boings up yeah. and down when they're talking. Now, these doors that open behind them aren't the right doors. They aren't those doors first use of the sound effect from the first movie as well. Yeah, because they used a lot of radiophonic sounds in this one. I've heard that Desmond Briscoe uh, supplied them with a tape of sounds but hadn't told Brian Hodgson and he was a bit miffed. Mm -hmm. It's another neat little uh, moment with Dortmund and Susan there where he's looking after her, pulls her back from the edge. And it's this sort of culminates that this almost sort of two dads relationship with the moment where she's trapped in the corridor in a bit, where uh, they're both trying to pull her to safety. This scene, particular scene, more closely replicated what we saw on the television uh, in some respects in the original script, because uh, we talked about the Doctor being bomb mad. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the in the draft script, before he dies, Dortmund gives the notes for the bombs to Barbara. Um, they are then passed on to the Doctor, and the Doctor here in the original draft script is basically saying, "Look, I've got these got these notes, and using them as a as a bit of a diversion tactic." Uh -huh. But all this ex explanation of uh, the deviation of the aiming of the bomb. And all the magnetics and how they're afraid of the magnetics doesn't appear at all in the original script. And it's a great pity, really, because uh, as hokey as the science is, at least it gives some reason for them doing what they're doing and the way they're doing it. Mm. But it, it's it's funny, though, that all of that scene where it looks like the Doctor Who is feeding Tom the information he needs to defeat the Daleks, he already had that briefing yeah. in the <laughs> shed. He was told all of that information of what he needed to do and was shown a diagram of it. And yet he nodded there like that was the first time he was hearing it. And it's nice that he's set an objective that he has to go and achieve. Whereas in the TV version, although Ian does save the world, it's, it's largely by fluke because of where he ends up and uh, the idea that he has spontaneously because of where he is. And it's nice that um, uh, Tom's character twice has the information delivered to him that he needs to sort this out. And essentially, this scene now would have been the end of the film. Mm. Susan uh, sees what the Doctor is trying to do to get to the Roberman control. She provides a diversion. He rushes over, orders the Robermen to attack. 
they do, a Dalek is pushed into the control panel and it explodes, and that's it. That's mm-hmm. the end of the Daleks. It's almost too similar to the ending of the first movie, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But it's a really wimpy ending compared to what we get. But also, in the original TV version, the the Robo Rebellion is successful. That's essentially the beginning of the end for the Daleks. And it's only in the final version of the movie that it's uh, a futile gesture. Uh, a few people escape, but the rebellion here is is quashed and the Daleks carry on their plan. It's not a great control panel, that, is it? That's a great control thing. I mean, yeah, the Rel Cantor is... Iconic. Legendary. I was trying not to say iconic. <laughs> you make Tim, Tim Burroughs angry. Well, that's why I said it. <laughs> The ending of Sabotsky's original draft script for Doctor and the Daleks ended with a caveman because that's in the BBFC notes and that version of the script is obviously what Dell Comics got because they include that in the comic strip. Oh. Um, so the very end of the comic strip doesn't have anything to do with the, with, with the Romans. The really surprising thing is is that we have so little information about the making of these films. Mm. Um, so little seems to have survived. Um, there hardly seems to be any paperwork about them. The one file that the BBC had, which covered the the films from 1962 through to 67, is completely missing now. It's gone. So we don't know what agreements they had and whether or not they were allowed to do certain things and not allowed to do certain things. Mm. It's all gone. Is that likely to be a result of them being made by this this weird company, Aru? Could that have something to do with the lack of don't know surviving documentation? Don't know. Just wish there was more, though. Yeah. <laughs> it would help to answer so many questions mm. about things. Mm. The sequence that's uh, that's going to about to come up very soon with the diversion of the bomb and the um, the resultant effects on the Daleks uh, probably was one of the most exciting things I saw as a child. <laughs> um, and uh, and I remember when I was re-watching the film, um, just waiting for all those little things to happen. Mm. I, I mean, I so desperately want to know what happened to the rubber Dalek and the history of the rubber Dalek. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a full-size Dalek, that deflating one, mm. which I hadn't realised before. It's remarkable. I mean, does that lend credence to the idea that the... The dummy Daleks in this are, are sort of jelly mould props as well, because you would have had to have taken a full-size mould of a Dalek to make a rubber cast. That's a good point. I think certainly the, the skirts, uh, there are a number of skirts, I think. John Kelly's done a lot of work looking at the, the skirts to see that there are moulded ones with the hemis moulded into the skirt. But I think that the shoulders of the dummies were more likely to be made from timber wrapped around or metal to, wrapped around the uh, some sort of um, frame. So here we go, our big finale. <laughs> There's a shot of the uh, flying saucer exploding, edited in. This was done twice, This uh, the explosion. As you can see, bits that are remade back up again. Now, I've a thought about, uh, you know, on the top deck of the big control area on the left, mm. there is a, a sort of lozenge shape grey device. And I have a sneaking suspicion that's a recycled aircraft fuselage prop. Ooh. Um, and I was thinking that already. And then I noticed today that there is a shot you'll see of the red Dalek as it bumps against it. Mm. And there is a shape in the surface that looks like a wing point. There, on the left. Oh, uh, yeah. You'd have to pause that. But it looks like the attachment point of a winglet or a wing. So either an aircraft fuselage or a spaceship fuselage, perhaps with little wings and two cockpits. It just looks a very odd shape to decide to have on the top deck of a Dalek control room. Uh it smells recycled to me. Could it be? Could it be from the Vickers Vimy? I wondered that as well. I don't think so, 
I don't think the fuselage is the right shape, but I did wonder that, and I, I need to go and look. Because, yeah, because there's two Vickers Vimy engines next to the hut. Um, but it did also make me think, you know, we, we, we always hope that eventually we'll find out what production all these props might have been used in. But those Vickers Vimy engines are a proof that that's not necessarily the case because they were built for production that was never finished. So no one will ever see the movie that those engines were built for. I think it's very bizarre that they, they repainted the black Dalek to do the sun of the, uh, you know, repainted a silver Dalek to be black. Mm. To to be thrown down the, the hole and then but then use the hero red prop. It just seems yeah, a, yeah. a very strange thing to do. Maybe they had a second one lined up in case the first one was no good. Maybe that's why they had multiple copies of Leader Daleks for promotional appearances, because they'd already made more than one for uh, backups and effects sequences. It's not a great model shot to end on. Mm. The final one's all right, but the the one where it's on fire. It's it's not, but the I, I think the the sound effect of the oh yes um, mm. uh, of the saucer in distress yeah <laughs> worked amazing. really well yeah because you can tell something's gonna big's gonna happen yeah saucer in distress <laughs> are there um, mountains in Bedford? <laughs> I'm not familiar with the geography of the area. Hillocks. <laughs> Massive hillocks. So you were saying that in the original script, Tom climbs into the bomb as Ian had done in the TV version. So does he sabotage it in the same way? No, he doesn't do anything. The Daleks start lowering the bomb down the shaft. The Robo Rebellion takes place. The Daleks are suddenly all dead because one of them has crashed into the into the panel. <laughs> and then they just bring him back up. And that's it. With a little comedy flourish of his head popping out of the top. <laughs> and he looks bemused. So now we go back to um, returning Tom to his timeline. Uh, now, this is one of the interesting things of Sabotsky's original script, because he seems to do pretty much an absolute 100% duplicate of what he does in Doctor Who and the Daleks. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, because Tom's not a policeman, you, you don't get all all this that we have. Mm. Um, they're actually in the TARDIS, and Tom goes to the door, opens it, looks out, and it says, uh, "External field day. A group of soldiers in the uniform of Agincourt are standing around their leader, who is addressing them. He is Henry V, and is delivering the famous St Crispin's Day or, uh, oration." If possible, we will get a clip from the uh, of this from the Laurence Olivier film. That's the 1944 one uh, of Henry VIII. Then uh, sh shot 128, internal TARDIS day. Tom gasps, shuts the door quickly, and rushes about addressing, uh, adjusting the controls <laughs> in speeded up action as we fade out. <laughs> so he's doing pretty much a carbon copy of what he does in the first film. Mm. Which is really strange. Well, I'm glad they did this instead. You, you do wonder how much of that draft is is almost placeholder stuff. Is is that writer thing of of you've got to get the first draft down and then and then work from there, and you don't necessarily 100 percent seriously mean everything you put because that that uh, opening uh, where he's just a a, a bloke looking to place a phone call is so perfunctory it feels feels quite like a placeholder so that was the end of Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD I thoroughly enjoyed that great stuff fabulous perfect 1960s fun fast paced brilliant film it's great it is fast paced isn't it mm. and I think I think fun is the word John yeah marvellous Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Reese, John, and especially Richard. It's been a privilege. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you can come back and do it again. Maybe for the third uh, Peter Cushing <laughs> Doctor Who movie, which, as we all know, is at the Earth's core. So we'll pencil that <laughs> in for 
next month, maybe. Uh, so it's goodbye from me and goodbye from everyone else. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ah. <laughs> oh. He's just shoved it in and massaged it a bit. <laughs>